It is written, 2 Samuel 5, 11, and 1 Kings 5, 1 through 10. The Kingdom of Tyre, today a district capital and the south government of Lebanon, just to the north of Israel, occupied Palestine along the Mediterranean coast, was, at the time of the erection of the first temple to Jehovah, the Hebrew deity, in Israel, while it was a united monarchy with Judah, which modern scholars of Hebrew tonic speculate to have been around 467 B.C., ruled by a king named Hiram. According to scriptures, 2 Chronicles 2, 13 and 14, King Solomon of unified Israel and Judah sent message to King Huram of Tyre to request he send workmen to assist in the building of this first temple to the universal God. The king of Tyre returned in kind by sending, quote, a skillful man endowed with understanding, Huram Yabi, close quote. Further reading, 1 Kings 7, 13 and 14, indicates this appellation, Abi, to infer Ab, Hebrew for father, E, suffixed as none, connoting without, and his thus widowed mother to have been of the Hebrew tribe of Naphtali. This Huram Abi, called by Lutheran scholars Hiram Abif, was said to be, quote, skilled to work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, stone and wood, purple and blue, fine linen and crimson, and to make any engraving and to accomplish any plan which may be given to him, close quote. Later Chronicles, Antiquities of the Jews, 8, 76, by Flavius Josephus, from 37 to 100 A.D. Add further credence to the translation of Abi as fatherless by referring to the artificer out of Tyre, whose name was Hiram, as having a father named Ur, a title which, even by then, implied lost or forgotten, alike the Sumerian town of Ur, long held to have been the first city. In the modern myth of Freemasonry, the character of Hiram Abiff, widow's son, is considered to have been the grand architect of Solomon's temple. The architecture of this first temple to God was, however, directly based on a previous design, that of the tabernacle, or portable wood and fabric tent structure carried by the wandering Hebrews throughout Sinai during the Exodus. The grand architect who constructed the original tabernacle was, as is written, Exodus 31, 2, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. The geometrical dimensions used as the basis for this structure were not designed by Bezalel either, though, but were instructed directly to Moses by God on Mount Sinai, just prior to God's inscription of the first twin tablets of testimony. The dimensions of the tabernacle's surrounding courtyard were given, Exodus 27, 
9 through 18 as 50 cubits with 10 pillars along the east and west walls by 100 cubits with 20 pillars along the north and south walls. The tabernacle itself, 25 cubits east-west by 10 cubits north-south, was partially partitioned off by a curtain to veil a cubical room at its west end called the Kodesh Ha Kodashim. Hebrew for Holy of Holies, 10 by 10 cubits, in which was kept the Ark of the Covenant, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, and one cubit tall, according to Exodus 25, 10. The vessel containing the most holy relics of contemporary Judaism the twin tablets containing the Ten Commandments, a golden urn containing manna, the bread from heaven, food stuff eaten during the Exodus, and the rejuvenated sapling almond rod of Aaron. Between two bowing cherubim angels made of gold on the lid of this ark, God promised Moses Exodus 25:22 I will speak with you from above Because the ark of the covenant was the showpiece of both the tabernacle and the temple the later layout for the first temple commissioned by King Solomon was just an upscaling of the same proportions used in the tabernacle structure during the Exodus In the temple the Holy of Holies room was a 20 by 20 by 20 cubits cubicle elevated on a stage 10 cubits above the floor of the Hekhal, Temple Hall, proper. The ceiling of the temple was thus 30 cubits tall and extended in a hall 40 cubits long between the veiled ark chamber's elevated entrance and the doorway to the ulam porch, which extended another ten cubits out from the temple's eastern front and on which stood twin hollow bronze pillars called Boaz for the southern and Jachin for the northern, confer two chronicles, 317 each 18 cubits in height and 12 cubits in circumference surrounding the entire building was a wall with an eight-stepped entrance in the east that divided the inner courtyard of the priests from the outer courtyard of the parishioners and this was surrounded by another wall with a seven-stepped eastern entrance. Now, the twin pillars of Jachin and Boaz were around six feet, or 1.8 meters thick, and 27 feet, or 8.2 meters tall. There were eight foot, 2.4 meters, high chapiters or capitals on top of the columns. Nets of checker work covered the bowl of each chapiter, and they were decorated with rows of 200 pomegranates, wreathed with seven chains each, and topped with brass lilies. Confer 1 Kings 7, 13 to 22, and 41 and 42. Because these twin pillars were hollow, speculation yet persists that they contained the tools used to construct the temple, as with the modern Masonic practice 
of hiding certain working tools of their craft inside the foundational cornerstone of public buildings. One such speculation involves the shamir, a green rock splitter, possibly a worm, kept wrapped in spongy wool balls and stored with loose barley bran in a container made of lead. Legend having it that the shamir could burst a vessel of any other kind of material. The legend of the shamir precedes that. It was the seventh of the ten marvels created by God in the evening twilight of the first Friday. It was the size of a single barley grain when Moses used it as a stylus to engrave the names of the twelve tribes onto the gemstones for the high priest's breastplate. Solomon, troubled about how to build the first temple without using iron-cutting tools on site, asked the sages for advice, and they told him to tie together two Shedim, demons, that he could summon, a male and a female. Doing so, Solomon learned he must then summon Ashmodai, in Hebrew, Asmodeus, in Latin, king of the demons. So King Solomon sent his messenger, Benaiah, who, through a ploy, managed to get Ashmodai drunk and captured him, placing a chain containing Hashem's name around him. Louis Ginsburg, in his 1940s Legends of the Jews, Volume 4, page 77, writes, Asmodeus told Solomon that the Shamir was given by God to the angel of the sea, and that angel entrusted none with the Shamir except the moor hen, which had taken an oath to watch the Shamir carefully. The moor hen, woodcock, or field rooster, now known as a woodpecker, was then tricked into surrendering the Shamir when forced to use it to rescue their captured offspring. The wood grouse then killed itself because it had violated its oath. When King Solomon desired more information from Ashmodai, the latter refused until the king removed the chain from around him and gave him his ring. Then Ashmodai tricked King Solomon, ousting him from the kingship and personally replacing him, impersonating the king on the throne. The true king was forced to go around begging claiming he was the real king of all Israel, and people thought him mad. Eventually, the sages realized what had happened and advised Solomon on how to regain his position. Because the twin columns of Chakin, meaning he shall establish, and Boaz, meaning in him there is strength, are described verbally, but no remains persist to portray them visually. Their actual appearance as historical artifacts has been essentially lost. When the Temple of Solomon was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar II, a year after the 587 BC Siege of Jerusalem, according to Tanakh, confer Jeremiah 52, 21 to 22, and 2 Kings, 25, 13. The Chaldeans broke up the bronze columns of the house of the Lord. In subsequent historical records, such as Josephus' histories and the Second Temple era Talmud, 
There is no further record of either of these hollow pillars, let alone the contents they concealed, ever being recovered. Following the first century AD, many scholars of the Kabbalah attributed these twin pillars to the active and passive aspects of Atsaluth, uppermost of the four realms, and the seven-branched candelabra to the seven lower or subtended sephirot emanations on the earliest tree of life type diagrams. Thus, by the late 1700s, when Freemasonry was emerging from its British-French Grand Lodge dispute between the ancient and accepted rites, its symbolism set associated Jaquin with the moon and Boaz with the sun. However, sometime around the early to mid-1800s, Following the final mapping of North America and before the Civil War between the Northern and Southern Jurisdictional States, 1861 to 1865, the chapters atop the pillars of Jaquin and Boaz began to be depicted in Freemasonic literature as twin orbs, one, a geodesic sphere, divided into longitudes and latitudes, and the other, a standard armillary sphere, divided into tropics and polar regions on a gyroscope. Hence, instead of the passive moon, Jaquin began to become associated with the sphere of the fixed heavens, and Boaz, instead of with the active sun, to be affiliated to the sphere of the moving heavens. Also by this point, in Hakwala, the pillar of Jaquin was associated with the upper sephirot, Chakma, wisdom, was colored white, and considered the pillar of mercy, and the pillar of Boaz was associated with the supernal sephirot, Benah, understanding, colored ebony, and believed to be the pillar of severity. Since the original penning of the Sefer Yetzira, Boaz, the pillar of severity, had been associated with the mother letter Shin, Hebrew, Sh, the element, fire, and a pan of merit, while Jaquin, the pillar of mercy, had been affiliated with the mother letter Mem, Hebrew M, the element water, and a pan of liability, while the middle pillar, or middle way, was attributed to the Mother letter Aleph, Hebrew A, the element air, and a breath to decide between them. From the 1920s until the 1940s, there was a wave of New Age theosophical resurgence in occult and ritual magic prevalent in Western society. As part of this movement, an upswing in Orientalism, leading to the earliest modern Western interest in yoga, swept across Europe and America. It was during this time that Aleister Crowley, a master magus, composed what would become the appendix to his final work on Tarot, called The Book of Thoth. In this work, Crowley proposes a series of 14 trigrams combining the usual yin, broken, and yang, unbroken, 
dowel rods with a single dot, symbolic in Crowley's system, of the dowel itself. This was, in effect, Crowley's attempt to order the trigrams of I Ching onto the structure of the Tree of Life model from Hakubala. By the mid to late 1900s, all these systems were being effectively combined. Hakubala, Freemasonry, and New Age magic had been nearly completely unified, partially via the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn's influence early on, but mostly due to the feverish devotion to syncretism among a select few aspirants, such as Levy, Blavatsky, Mathers, Crowley, Manley Hall, and Kenneth Grant, etc. As the turning of the Christian calendrical millennium approached at the end of the 1900s and dawn of the 2000s era, the third millennia since the crucifixion of Christ also infused occultists with exponential enthusiasm that, in turn, pushed the movement of chaos magic into its modern blind momentum toward the undiscovered country of complete quantum scale uncertainty. As the calendar's years counted down to 1999, the final year of the old aeon, until stopping like the hands of an unwound clock in 2000, before restarting again in 2001, the first year of the new aeon. Certain symbols became seemingly indelibly affixed to the modern Western esoteric mystery school tradition, including the Freemasonic compass and square, the basic working tools of the craft, the Egyptian pyramid and Eye of Providence motifs, and the twin pillars from the Hebrew Temple of King Solomon, Joaquin and Boaz, with the New Age modifications to them of being a white pillar topped with a celestial sphere and a black pillar topped by a terrestrial globe, respectively. Nevertheless, what these symbols mean remains a mystery to most outside the initiated. The incised fibula bone of a baboon from around 44,200 to 43,000 years ago, found in the Labombo Mountains between South Africa and Swaziland, and the similar baboon fibula from some 20,000 plus years ago, found in Ishango near the Semliki River, the Nile River's headwaters. Maybe tally sticks used for keeping long counts of number sums. Especially the Labombo bone, which has 29 notches and thus may have been used as a rough calendar to mark the number of nights in a full monthly cycle of lunar phases. If these tally sticks from around 45,000 years ago truly were used as rudimentary calendrical measurements of time, there ought to be little doubt that the Lascaux cave paintings from some 17,000 years ago could also be a rudimentary form of zodiac. The term zodiac refers to a bestiary of 12 zoomorphic constellations surrounding Earth's tropic region in an inclined ecliptic circle. Arguably, the earliest now known depictions of anything resembling that definition would be the paintings with black charcoal, white ash, 
and red ochre in caves across Europe. Because these parietal wall paintings date to around 17,000 years ago, they indicate the thinking of prehistoric mankind at a time some 23,000 to 33,000 years after we reached behavioral modernity. While they probably are not an intentional precursor towards it, these cave paintings, such as those of horses, bulls, etc. at Lascaux, France, definitely precede and may have influenced later thinking about the nature of and how to cartographically depict the fixed heavens. The lion body of the Egyptian Sphinx in Giza, near the necropolis of the Great Pyramid, being carved out from a surrounding enclosure, and both the body and enclosure being extremely geologically weathered, remains difficult to date. Although the body and enclosure of the Sphinx may prove to be an ancient subterranean mastaba, or tumulus. Ground-penetrating radar reveals promising signs of underground chambers there. The paws and head of the structure were also clearly built up later on. Insofar as the original date of the body and enclosure's carving cannot yet be specified, and insofar as the human-faced head and lion paws were built later, it is not yet possible to determine if the Sphinx was intended to symbolize a lion when it was first carved out from the enclosure, or if it was simply a burial mound. What should be clear enough, however, is that the Great Sphinx of Giza represents one of the earliest zodiacal megaliths, being a depiction of a lion such as that which would later come to be identified as the zodiac constellation, Leo. The astrological zodiac round, as we know it now, is a circle symbolizing the equatorial ecliptic, divided into 360 degrees, where each degree of the circle is equal to one full day of the year divided likewise into four seasons of three months each, wherein each month is divided into 30 days or degrees, and where each season is comprised of 90. The signs of the zodiac round, as they have been since they were established by some 2,500 years ago, notably without sense being updated to account for processional drift, resulting in the up to two sign discrepancy between the so-called sun sign and rising sign on one's natal chart. Follow Aries, Taurus, and Gemini in spring. Cancer, Leo, and Virgo in summer, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius in autumn, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces in winter. However, the origin of the base 12 zodiac round obviously predates this. The eldest likely possible backdating for the invention of the zodiac round as a means of cartographically plotting out a model for the heavens lies in Mesopotamia, Sumer, Akkad, Assyria, and Babylonia, not earlier than the reign of Sargon of Akkad, 2334 to 2279 BC about whom there are two astrological references made in the later work 
now called the Venus Tablet of Amisaduka, compiled in Babylon around 1700 BC. The next ruler referenced in the Venus Tablet was Judea of Lagash, around 2144 to 2124 BC. And it is described how the gods revealed to him in a dream the constellations that would be most favorable for the planned construction of a temple. While horary astrology and the reading of present omens was clearly present before the 70 cuneiform tablets comprising 7,000 celestial omens of the Enuma, Anu, Enlil, a series probably compiled into its current canonical form during the Kassite period, 1595 to 1157 BC. The Venus Tablet of Amasaduka, Enuma Anu Enlil Tablet 63, copied from a tablet written in Babylon while Sargon II was king of Assyria, between 720 and 704 BC demonstrates that electional or event astrology and making future predictions was not fully developed in the Middle East until almost 2,500 years ago. In 525 BC Egypt was conquered by the Persians and the twelve constellation signs of the Babylonian zodiac began to be merged with the thirty-six deacons of the Egyptian solar civic calendar, with the result being the zodiac round of 360 degrees, each deacon being a week of ten days, with three such deacon weeks per 30-day monthly zodiac sign, thus creating the complete method of horoscopic astrology able to make assessments about any given moment in the grand cycling of time, whether it be in the past, present, or future. The eldest now known and most intactly preserved example of this is the Egyptian Dendara Zodiac, a bas-relief from the ceiling of the proneos or portico of a chapel dedicated to Osiris in the Hathor Temple at Dendara, sixth gnome of Upper Egypt, south of Abydos. This chapel was begun in the late Ptolemaic period. The earliest extant building in the compound today is the Mamesi, raised by Nectanebo II, last of the native pharaohs, 360 until 343 BC. But its proneos was added by the emperor Tiberius, 42 BC, to 37 AD. The interior date for the Dindara zodiac's origin indicates it was engraved between a lunar eclipse on September 25th, 52 BC, and a solar eclipse on March 7th, 51 BC. During the same period of time, the Han Dynasty the second imperial dynasty of China, 206 BC until 220 AD, began developing the four pillars of destiny, astrology based on sexagenary years, months, days, and hours, the Wu Jing, the five phases of matter, being wood, fire, earth, metal, water, 
according to the mutual generation sequence, with their five planets, and the twelve earthly branches, Chinese astronomers divided the celestial circle into twelve sections to follow the orbit of Su Zheng, Jupiter, the year star, which astronomers rounded to 12 years from 11.86. Each of these 12 years was assigned an animal, but the resemblance to the elder Babylonian Egyptian 12 monthly constellation signs of the zodiac round appears, as of yet, coincidental and not directly causally related. Besides the 28 lunar mansions, most charted constellations in Chinese astronomy are based on the works of Shi Shenfu and Gan Di, who were astronomers during the period of Warring States, 481 to 221 BC. The Dunhuang star map, thought to date from the reign of Emperor Zhang Zong of Tang, 705 to 710 AD, distinguishes constellations identified by different schools with different colors. White, black, and yellow for stars of Wu Zhan, Gan Di, and Shi Shen, respectively. The whole set of star maps contained 1,300 stars. Su Song, 1020 to 1101 AD, wrote Jin Yi. Zhang Fio in 1092 AD and published it in 1094. This was a treatise on his hydromechanical astronomical clock tower in medieval Kaifeng, which employed the use of an early escapement mechanism a water-powered armillary sphere, the first to be provided with a mechanical clock drive, the oldest known endless power transmitting chain drive, called the TNT, or Celestial Ladder, and 133 different clock jacks to indicate and sound the hours. Su Song's star maps represent the oldest existent in printed form and include equidistant cylindrical projection star maps as well as north and south polar projections for Su's celestial globe. The earliest development of the armillary sphere goes back to the first century BC when they were equipped with a primitive single ring instrument. During the Western Han Dynasty, 202 BC to 9 AD, additional developments made by the astronomers Lu Zhang Zhang Yu Wangren and Gang Xiaoyu Chang advanced the use of the armillary in its early stage of evolution. In 52 BC, it was the astronomer Geng Shuchang who introduced the fixed equatorial ring to the armillary sphere. The first celestial globe was made by Geng Shuchang between 70 and 50 BC. In the subsequent Eastern Han Dynasty, 23 until 220 AD period, the astronomers Fu An 
and Jia Kui added the elliptical ring by 84 AD with the famous statesman, astronomer, and inventor Zhang Heng, 78 to 139 AD. The sphere was totally completed in 125 AD with horizon and meridian rings. The world's first hydraulic, water-powered, armillary sphere was created by Zhang Heng, 78 until 139 AD, who operated it by use of an inflow clepsydra clock by the Ming Empire, 1368 to 1644 AD, the celestial globe showed the 28 mansions, celestial equator, and ecliptic. None of these earliest celestial globes have survived outside of writing and art. The Farnese Atlas is a 7 foot 2.1 meters tall, 150s A.D., Roman marble copy of a Hellenistic sculpture of Atlas, Titan of Greek mythology, only known to have been represented earlier in vase paintings, whom had been sentenced by Zeus to hold up the sky. In this case, the sky is depicted as a 65 centimeter diameter celestial sphere with low reliefs depicting 41 or 42 of the 48 classical Greek constellations distinguished by Ptolemy 100 until 170 AD and based presumably in the original, of which the Farnese is a copy, on the star charts of Hipparchus, around 129 BC. The evidence of shadow clocks, called gnomons, or modernly called sundials, dates to at least ancient Babylon, where they were used in both astrology to construct the solar and lunar eclipse tables used in the Enuma Anu Enlil 68 to 70 tables of between 6,500 and 7,000 omens tabulated in the Old Babylonian period 1950 to 1595 BC and canonized in the Kassite period, 1595, until 1157 BC. And in astronomy, to calculate the declinations of stars listed in the Aristala Bays in 1800 to 1100 BC, compilation of 36 celestial observations of 12 stars from the three cities of Elam, Akkad, and Amaru, which was likely the origin for the 12 months of the year on the Babylonian calendar. The oldest surviving sundial model was found in the Valley of the Kings on the west bank of the Nile, opposite Thebes, modern Luxor, and it was long believed that the Tekhenu, the original Egyptian term for what the Greeks called obeliscos, functioned in the same manner, although this theory is debated today. According to the Persian historian Herodotus, 484 until 425 BC. Sundials were introduced into Greece 
around 560 BC by Anaximander of Miletus, 610 until 546 BC. Nicholas Copernicus, 1473 to 1543 AD, attributed the heliocentric theory to Aristarchus of Samos, 310 until 230 BC, a student of Philolos of Croton, 470 until 385 BC, whom, in turn, had been a student of Pythagoras of Samos, 570 until 495 BC. And Aristarchus is also credited with inventing the scaphe, a hemispherical bowl or a quarter sphere with a horizontal gnomon needle and 12 units to measure the daylight hours. Eratosthenes of Cyrene, 276 until 194 BC, a Greek astronomer from Hellenistic Cyrenaica, named after the city of Cyrene in the eastern coastal region of modern-day Libya, estimated Earth's circumference around 240 BC first calculated the tilt of Earth's axis, accurately calculated the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and invented the leap day. Eratosthenes calculated the circumference of the Earth without leaving Egypt. He knew that at local noon on the summer solstice in Syene, modern Aswan, Egypt, the sun was directly overhead. Syene is at latitude 24 degrees 5 minutes north, near to the Tropic of Cancer, which was 23 degrees 42 minutes north in 100 BC. He knew this because the shadow of someone looking down a deep well at that time, in Syene, blocked the reflection of the sun on the water. He then measured the sun's angle of elevation at noon in Alexandria by using a vertical rod as a gnomon and measuring the length of its shadow on the ground. Using the length of the rod and the length of the shadow as the legs of a triangle, he calculated the angle of the sun's rays. This turned out to be about 7 degrees, or 1 50th, the circumference of a circle. His knowledge of the size of Egypt was founded on the work of many generations of surveying trips. Pharaonic bookkeepers gave a distance between Syene and Alexandria of 5,000 stadia, a figure that was checked yearly. Taking the Earth as spherical, and knowing both the distance and direction of Syene, Eratosthenes concluded that the Earth's circumference was 50 times that distance. His result was 40,074 kilometers only 66 kilometers different from 40,008 kilometers, Earth's meridional circumference. He later rounded the result to a final value of 700 stadia of 185 meters each per 1 360th or one degree, which implies a circumference of 252,000 stadia. Likely for reasons of calculation simplicity, as this number is evenly divisible by 60.
although lost in the 48 BC fire, begun by Julius Caesar setting fire to his own ships that consumed the legendary library of Alexandria, north-central Egypt, of which in 240 BC, at age 35, Eratosthenes had once himself been chief librarian. Eratosthenes' three-volume work, Geographica, was the first use of a world map, as referenced by later historians, including Pliny, Polybius, Strabo, and Marcianus. In this work, Eratosthenes described and mapped the entire then-known world, dividing the earth into five climate zones, two freezing zones around the poles, two temperate zones, and a zone encompassing the equator and the tropics. Placing grids of overlapping lines over the surface of the earth, using parallels and meridians to link together every place in the world, making it possible to estimate one's distance from remote locations, and giving names of over 400 cities and their locations. Crates of Malas, 100s BC, was chief librarian of Pergamon, a competitor library to that of Alexandria, located in Pergamon City in Aeolus, an ancient district on the western coast of Asia Minor, now in western Turkey, and was, according to Strabo, the inventor of the first model of a terrestrial globe. This globe portrayed the world as four quarter spheres, occupied in turn by four continents. Wikimeni, Europe, North Africa, and Asia. The Perioeci, now known as North America. The Antipodes, South America. And the Antiochiae, Australia. The oldest still existing terrestrial globe artifact was made in 1492 AD by Martin Benheim, 1459 until 1537 AD, with help from the painter George Glockenden, 1484 until 1514 AD and was called the Erdapfel, German for Earth Apple, of Nuremberg. The only portion of the Americas depicted is a small isle labeled St. Brendan, the island of Sipangu, Japan, is oversized and well south of its true position, and Australia is absent. The second oldest modern globe, and first to show a large portion of South America, by then having been discovered and reported on by Christopher Columbus and Amerigo Vespucci, dates from approximately 1504 A.D. and likely comes from Florence, Italy and the workshop of Leonardo da Vinci. This globe gives 71 place names, only seven of them in the Western Hemisphere. No names are shown for North America which is represented as a group of scattered islands. Three names are shown in South America, Mundus Novus, or New World, Terra de Brazil, 
and Terra Sancta Crucis, or Land of the Holy Cross, and two for islands. Cuba appears as Isabel, and the island shared by the Dominican Republic and Haiti, Hispaniola, appears as Spagnola. It depicts ships of different types, monsters, intertwining waves, a shipwrecked sailor, and one sentence, Hic sunt dracones, in Latin, here there be dragons, off the eastern coast of Asia. The globe is made from the bottom halves of two ostrich eggs. The Hunt Lennox globe from around 1510 AD is a copper cast of this egg globe that measures 112 millimeters 4.4 inches in diameter and 345 millimeters, 13.6 inches, in circumference. Each hemisphere, north and south, is its own part, and these are joined at the equator and held together by a wire strung through the holes at the north and south poles. It is similar, in many regards, to the Yagiolian globe, also from 1510 AD, and either from North Italy as well, or from Southern France. But the Yagiolian version includes America Novator Reperta. America newly discovered as an island in the Indian Ocean and excludes the phrase Hic sunt dracones.